Okay, look at that, a well-behaved audience. Uh, never made history. What is this? Everyone quieting down. That's excellent. Now, my name is Doug Bradburn. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington, the Washington Library, where you find yourselves today on this really beautiful evening and a fantastic occasion because it is an inaugural lecture. It's the first annual Martha Washington Lecture, uh, which was created by one of the great friends of Mount Vernon, a foundation that's funded many things here, including the uh, Education Center uh, and the library itself, the Richard S. Reynolds Foundation from Richmond, Virginia. Richard Reynolds Sr. was the nephew of the famous North Carolina Reynolds, the philanthropist R.J. Reynolds, who some of you may have heard of R.J. Reynolds a little bit. Uh, the nephew also had some business acumen and skill. Uh, Richard S. Reynolds went his own way, founding the U.S. Foil Company in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, which we all know from Reynolds Wrap. So that's, uh, we've all used Reynolds Wrap, uh, and, uh, and that's where Richard S. Reynolds built his own fortune. His son, Richard S. Reynolds Jr., went on to found a stock brokerage house that later became Dean Winter Reynolds in New York. <coughs> And his grandson, Richard S. Reynolds III, has continued the family legacy of philanthropic leadership uh, through the Richard S. Reynolds Foundation, established in 1955 by his grandmother, Julia Louise Reynolds, in honor of her late husband. Now, Richard S. Reynolds, known as Major Reynolds, and his wife, Pam Reynolds, have been very involved in the arts, in education, cultural advancement. Uh, he's been a longtime trustee of the Virginia Historical Society, Pamela Reynolds, is a recent past chairman of the board of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and is a member of Monticello's board. And we don't hold that against her at all here at Mount Vernon. We see her as a kindred spirit uh, uh, advocating for the preservation of one of America's great sites. Now, the idea for this lecture was Pam Reynolds's idea. When the foundation in Mount Vernon uh, approached her and them for support for the National Library, it was her immediate suggestion to do something honoring Martha Washington, the amazing woman that was so integral to the founding era, and also to make this an annual lecture in honor of women's history in the founding era itself. And in fact, uh, it will be expanding as a program honoring women's history at this place, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, of course, in Mount Vernon, let me uh, see if I can go back and, and switch the, uh, can we switch out this to Mount Vernon itself? And uh, the, we love Handsome George, but today it, it is Women's History Month and we want to honor uh, the ladies uh, of Mount Vernon itself. Uh, so we'll get that up in a minute. Of course, for those of you who don't know the great story of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association who came together in the 1850s to save the house, of handsome George here that was falling into disrepair and created the first all women's uh, organization in, in America that uh, uh, focused on historic preservation and really been a leader uh, in that realm since then. So it's crucially important that we have uh, an opportunity in the library not only to sponsor scholarship in that direction, but honor that legacy as well. Uh, before I introduce our speaker who in some ways me needs no introduction, uh, I would mention that one of the great uh, opportunities the library is pursuing this year is expanding the Papers of George Washington project to include uh, Martha Washington's letters, the Washington family papers. So Martha's correspondence and papers are going to get their due as well. Uh, and, and that's a very exciting opportunity moving forward, uh, bringing them together, editing them, annotating them, and publishing them for people and scholars to use all over uh, the world. All right. So. Yes, we, we, we it, <laughs> Matt Briney, Vice President of New Media, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I know how to work this display. I work in this building every day, but it's something, uh, there's something going on with it right now. I could just start pushing things. <laughs> uh, we don't. Ah, here we go. There we go. That's how you do it. You're welcome. Okay. All right, all right, so without further ado, let's get to the main event. Uh, we're honored tonight to have Koki Roberts uh, speak to us about some of her work on 
profoundly women. As I said, she doesn't, in some ways, you feel like she doesn't need an introduction. When I met her for the first time earlier, I felt like I've known her for a long time because I've been watching her on TV my whole life. I listen to her in the morning on the radio, and it, it is uh, exciting to have her here today. Uh, she holds more than 20 honorary degrees. She serves on the boards of several nonprofit institutions uh, and on the President's Commission on Service and Civic Participation. This year, the Library of Congress named her a living legend, uh, which is an extraordinary thing to be called uh, for excellence uh, in her own life. Uh, she's on there with, with other remarkable people. Uh, I know she would be proudest of her accomplishments as a mother of two and the grandmother of six as well. Um, but you know her, of course, as the longtime co-anchor of ABC's This Week with Sam Donaldson from 1996 to 2002. Uh, she's won three Emmy Awards and the Edward R. Murrow Award. Uh, she's the best-selling author of numerous books. I think we're up to six books written and some co-written. The sixth is coming out. I have to mention this as well. Just came out or is coming out this month. Capital Dames, Civil War and the Women of Washington, 1848 to 1868. So I encourage you to keep your eyes out for what is soon to be the next national bestseller of Koki Roberts, but tonight she's going to talk about some of her work on founding mothers, the women who raised our nation. Please, everyone welcome Koki Roberts. Well, thank you, and I'm certainly glad I no longer have George staring over my shoulder. Um, <laughs> this is a great event because for years, I mean years, I have been coming here for various events, teacher institutes, whatever, and saying, what is with this George Washington's Mount Vernon? You know, did he do it all by himself? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, he, re he himself referred to the house as a well-resorted tavern that everyone stopped at going north or south. And, uh, you know, he had to have somebody supplying that tavern of, for food for all of those many, many guests. And, of course, that person was Martha Washington. And let's keep in mind, it was her money that paid for the whole thing. So uh, Mount Vernon would not be Mount Vernon were it not for Martha Washington. So I do, I, I'm thrilled that finally uh, we are having at least a lecture in her name. And, um, and with any luck, I'll someday convince them to say George and Martha Washington's Mount Vernon. <laughs> and I am going to give her her due tonight. Um, I actually am going to talk solely about her and not, not the other women because it's time. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit more for just a second about the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, because it is an extraordinary uh, story. Um, I'm sure many of you know it, and Pamela Cunningham's mother came by the house in 1853 and was horrified. You know, it was just in such uh, disrepair. And uh, so Miss Cunningham started organizing the Ladies of the South to buy the place and, uh, and then extended the appeal to women of the country. But John Augustus Washington wasn't having it. The fact that he couldn't afford it at all and the place was falling down around his feet um, didn't convince him. He would prefer for the United States government or the Virginia government to buy the house and neither one was offering any cash. Um, so finally he agreed to part with the property for $200,000. Now, how these women did this, it's just absolutely remarkable. He did say, you know, after he had resisted all this time, that the women of the land would be the purest guardians of the National Shrine. And, of course, they were the only ones ready to offer cold cash. Um, <laughs> they had four years to come up with it, and they beat the target. And they basically did it through bake sales. I mean, it really was, you know, the most nickel and dime fundraising that you've ever heard of. Uh, and they did theater benefits and concerts and tableau and balls, all the kind of stuff we all still do. Um, but, um, but doing it in a short period of time for a vast sum of money. Uh, in, in the new book that I have coming out this month, uh, Abigail Brooks Adams, who is Charles Francis Adams' wife, the Da the daughter-in-law of John Quincy Adams, the granddaughter-in-law of John and Abigail Adams. 
And she came here, she, or Charles Francis was in Congress in 1860, which was not a pleasant thing to be. Um, they're bad now. Then, she, as she says, they, they're all armed. And they're, <laughs> she wrote this, and, and their hands go to their breast at the slightest provocation. But she um, came here just for a visit, and this is April 9th, 1860. None of these letters have been published. And she says, the whole thing is a disgraceful ruin. Uh, she had been one of the fundraisers back in Massachusetts, in Quincy. And so she wanted to come see it. And she said, they estimate it will cost $20,000 to put it in repairs and 2000 yearly to keep it so. Now think of this. This is now 1860, and it's volunteer ladies doing this. It's really a remarkable uh, story. and. Um, the Civil War, of course, uh, made it much more difficult. Miss Cunningham decamped for the South, and uh, her stalwart secretary, Sarah Tracy, <coughs> ran the place with the armies on both sides uh, all around. I had this kind of starry-eyed hope that the sisterhood of the women regents would be such that you know they wouldn't choose sides, and um, of course that was absurd. And um, <laughs> and uh, Mary Thompson, who's the much more clear-eyed researcher here, uh, reveals that there were many tensions uh, in that period of time uh, and that there were some attempts at sabotaging the organization, but that the women, even if they weren't uh, all unified in the cause, did stay together uh, because they adopted a neutral attitude based on the need to work <coughs> together and get along, uh, says Mary Thompson. And so they survived that war, two others, terrorist attacks, um, the Depression, the recession, uh, the, and built this incredible establishment that we see here tonight, uh, not only restoring the house and uh, having uh, reenactments that really bring alive the people who lived in the house, including the enslaved people, but also the, uh, this wonderful center of learning that we now have uh, where we can uh, understand and study this crucial period in our history. And so I, um, and they did it, they've done it, I know, I know most of you know this, but they've done it without one penny of state, federal, or local government money. The only government money they ever took was $7,000 after the Civil War to compensate them for the loss of tourism during the war. And so, and, uh, and that's it. And um, so it is, and it is really an incredible feat. And I would not know what I know about Martha Washington were it not for the research that's been done here because uh, the letters that have been compiled, and it's really detective work. Women's history, early women's history is always detective work, but um, it is, it is um, especially hard for Martha Washington because, and I would kill her if she weren't already dead, um, she burned her correspondence. I mean, we're pretty sure that's the case. And so uh, it makes it much harder to know about her. And, and so she's kind of done herself a disservice uh, because really she uh, is someone who's quite extraordinary. And learning about that has been a great treat, but you, it's not easy to do. Uh, Doug just showed me tonight one of the few letters that is extant uh, that George Washington wrote to Martha. And it's a lovely, affectionate letter as he's about to go off to camp for the first time in 1775 to Cambridge, where you know they hold up in Harvard dorms. Um, but that letter came after the most famous letter. Uh, by the way, these letters were found in a drawer in a desk, you know, that had, that had escaped her pyrotechnics. And, um, and so that letter came after this one, which just cracks me up, because this is the letter he wrote that, you know, we, that everyone quotes. My dearest, I am now set down to write you on a subject which fills me with an inexpressible concern. And this concern is greatly aggravated and increased when I reflect on the uneasiness I know it will give you. 
It has been determined in Congress that the whole army raised for defense of the American cause has been put under my care, and that it is necessary for me to proceed immediately to Boston to take upon me the command of it. He assured her that far from seeking this appointment, I have used every endeavor in my power to avoid it. Right. Um, <laughs> He left home wearing his militia jacket, you know, it was not exactly subtle. He knew exactly what he was up to, and I suspect she did too. Um, but I also think that part of the reason she's never been given her due is kind of a prejudice about appearances, you know, the portrait that's most famous of her, she's elderly, and she wears that cap, which is a problem. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but really, it is, it, it does her a disservice because, of course, she was a very lively, very pretty, uh, as far as we can tell, um, and certainly interesting woman. Uh, the main thing most of us know about her, if we know anything at all, is about the winter that she spent at Valley Forge. And uh, that was the one thing that I had ever learned um, in school about Martha Washington, that she spent a winter at Valley Forge starving and freezing with the soldiers. But, of course, she actually spent every winter of the eight long years of the Revolution, she spent every winter at camp with the Continental Army. Um, I must say, just as an aside, the winter at Valley Forge, even though the American women were doing yeoman service, uh, out there freezing, uh, trying to keep the troops from deserting, the person that we as Americans should be most grateful to was actually a woman in Philadelphia. Because the British were, had occupied Philadelphia, they could have picked up, marched out to Valley Forge at any moment and completely decimated our pathetic army. But they were having way too good a time in Philadelphia. <laughs> and and uh, the loyalist women were entertaining them. And uh, one woman in particular, Betsy Loring, was uh, known for her uh, keeping, the, uh, keeping Sir William Howe, the British commander, occupied. And everybody knew about it. There were ditties in the newspapers. You know, Sir William, he uh, lays snug as, Sir William, he lays snug as a flea, flea, all the time a snoring, nor dreamed of harm as he lay warm in bed with Mrs. Loring. So, um, <laughs> We have her to be grateful to. Um, I'd love to say she did it out of patriotism. She did not. Uh, she she was got a good job for her husband in the British Army, and I don't know, maybe she likes Sir William. But um, at any rate, most of these women were absolutely incredible patriots, and, and Martha Washington is at the top of that list. I can really make a case uh, that she was absolutely essential in keeping the Continental Army together. And Washington certainly thought so. He begged her to come to camp. Uh, and he knew that she would have a, an impact on troop morale. And she didn't want to go. Uh, the roads were awful. She was a prime target for hostage taking. And the British did take Patriot wives hostage. A couple of them died. In, in captivity. Um, and before she had ever left Mount Vernon in the first place, there was a rumor that the British governor was going to kidnap her, and she just laughed it off. Uh, but she did, she still uh, did go, um, partly because there was also a rumor that she was a loyalist, and she had to go and prove her patriotism. Um, but she also didn't like leaving behind the responsibilities that she had here at Mount Vernon. She felt tugged in both directions. And, um, and it was scary to be so near the battlefront. When she first went in the winter of um, 1775, she wrote to a friend, I confess I shudder every time I hear the sound of a gun. Uh, but she did it because she was needed. And she said in one letter, the general has written to me that he cannot come home this winter, but as soon as the army under his command goes into winter quarters, he will send for me. If he does, I must go. Uh, she told that to her brother-in-law, though she, she was distressed because uh, her sister had died and she wanted to be there with the family. 
after her sister died, but she had the responsibility, the duty, and this was the theme of her life, was that she would fulfill her duty. Um, and you know, we talk about that with George Washington a lot, but Martha Washington was absolutely dedicated to duty. And not only was it sort of unpleasant and, and uncomfortable and cold, uh, but that people would come calling. I mean, you had to entertain at camp, for heaven's sakes. And um, uh, people were very curious to see what Lady Washington looked like, all of that. And that first camp at, um, in Cambridge, everybody in Boston came. And the, um, the, one of the people who came, actually Washington was glad to see, and that was Phyllis Wheatley, the slave poet. And for, for those of you who don't know her story, it's incredible. Uh, she was a slave in a family in Boston, and of course that's one of the things that we forget, is that, as Abigail Adams termed it, the sin of slavery was in all the colonies uh, before the war. And uh, this child arrived probably seven or eight years old, and the reason we know that is she still had her baby teeth. And she arrived from Africa on the ship, the Phyllis, and uh, moved in with the Wheatley family, and they discovered that she was very smart. And the teenagers in the family started teaching her to read and write in English, and then the Bible, and then Greek and Latin. And uh, she then started publishing poetry, and it was published in all the newspapers. And then she wanted it published in a book, and nobody would publish it as a book. So all the important men in Boston wrote letters um, endorsing her and saying, she really is who she is. She's a teenage female slave. And she wrote these poems. And they were published in London, and she became an international celebrity. Uh, one of the things that amazes me is how fast things actually did uh, get across the ocean in terms of ideas and plays and all of that. Oliver Goldsmith's play opened six weeks later in New York after London, which is surprising. But she, um, but she was there in camp, and Washington said he was pleased to greet someone so gifted by the muse. Mercy Otis Warren also went calling, curious as she could be. And, um, and of course, she was a great propagandist for the revolution and egged on by Sam Adams and John Adams to keep writing plays and poetry to get people riled up against the British. But she also wrote a lot of letters uh, which were saved. And, you know, she didn't know that I'd be reading them 200 years later. And um, <laughs> she went to dinner with George Washington uh, Generals Charles Lee and Horatio Gates. And she said, Washington's one of the most amiable and accomplished gentlemen, both in person, mind, and manners that I have ever met with. But generally, not so much. Uh, <laughs> he was plain, plain in his person to a degree of ugliness, careless even to unpoliteness, his garb ordinary, his voice rough, his manners rather morose. So that was, you know, that's the joy of reading these things later. And that really is it's one of the reasons that I'm so sorry about the loss of most of Martha's letters, because women's letters are wonderful. They're just a completely different, uh, it, it's a much more complete view of history. Because the men of this period were well aware of what they were doing. They knew that they were doing something extraordinary. And if they succeeded, uh, that they would be uh, held in high acclaim and remembered for posterity. So they wrote with that in mind. They wrote letters that they thought would be published. And they, they carry the weight of posterity. It's as if they were written by the bronze and marble statues that these men have all become. And um, the women's letters are complete. They do cover politics. Oh, enormously. They're very interested in politics, they have very strong political views, they're all there. But they're also about what's happening economically, about what's happening in fashion, about who's having babies and all too often losing them. I mean, you get the full picture of society and you also get a much um, more flesh and blood picture of the men because you see them as fathers and brothers and sons and lovers uh, with all of the the frailties and flaws and fun that that all implies. Um, so it is 
a treat to read the letters, and I'm sorry we don't have more of hers, but we, the people here have collected as many as they can about her, at least, even if not from her. Uh, she would come here, you know, over the summers. After, actually, that first winter in, in um, Cambridge, she f first went to Philadelphia, unbeknownst to George Washington. She went to Philadelphia and took the very dangerous smallpox inoculation, which was deadly in many cases. If you survived it, you were unlikely to get smallpox, but it was a big if. And uh, he was amazed that she had done it. And she did it for two reasons. She did it because she wanted to be safer in camp herself, but she also wanted to set an example for the troops. I mean, again, that sense of duty. And Washington was able to say, well, look, Mrs. Washington, you know, the girl did it. And, um, and uh, it made a big difference because they were much less set upon by smallpox than the British and the Hessians. Um, then she, she would come home here and go back uh, to the camp for winter, and uh, when she would arrive, she was she was adored by the troops, and people would would cheer. You know, Lady Washington is here as she came into camp. Now she came with a carriage full of foodstuffs that had been pickled and preserved and smoked here over the summer, cloth that had been woven here. These are some of the contributions that we don't think about enough about African American contributions to the cause because these were the enslaved workers of Mount Vernon doing this for the American troops. And, um, and sh at times uh, when the situation of the army was horrible, they were unpaid, unfed, unhoused, unclothed, and threatening desertion by regiment. Uh, Martha Washington was there as a great, and she also had the other officers' wives uh, following in her footsteps as, as the um, great morale booster. And they would cook for the soldiers and sew for the soldiers and nurse the soldiers and pray with the soldiers and, and put on big entertainments for them to keep them amused uh, during the long winter months. And I must say, it was good that Martha was on hand for those because George could be indiscreet. Um, there was one dance where he, for three hours straight, was on the dance floor with the very flirty and pretty Catherine Littlefield Green, uh, Nathaniel Green's wife. So it was good that Martha was on hand, uh, <clears throat> keeping an eye on things. Um, she also had a, a great sense of humor. She named her Tomcat Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> appropriately. And um, one winter when they were in New Jersey, the enemy was actually quite near. And it was scary. And uh, so there were guards assigned to her. And the soldiers vied for the honor. They loved uh, guarding her because they loved her. Um, but a, a bunch of congressmen, you know, Congress was kind of moving around, escaping the British too. And at this point, they were meeting in New Jersey. And uh, so they wanted to stay with her as well. And one of the soldiers wrote home, he said, I am happy with the importance of my charge, as well as the presence of the most amiable woman upon earth. But um, he was not so thrilled with the congressman. He said, the rations they have consumed considerably overbalance all their service done as volunteers. <laughs> For they have dined with us every day almost and drank as much wine as they would earn in six months. So, but that's a letter that Mary Thompson here at Mount Vernon un unearthed. And uh, so that a lot of what we know is from uh, her research and other research here. Um, so she, she would go, Martha would go annually uh, to camp despite the privations. Uh, and she did it out of duty, but she also wanted to be near her husband. Uh, and um, Nathaniel Green at one point wrote to his wife, who wasn't in camp that year. Kitty Green could, could never decide whether to go to camp or not. She hated staying home in Rhode Island with her really boring Quaker in-laws. Um, <laughs> but every time she went to camp, she got pregnant. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> but, um, he wrote to her, Mrs. Washington is excessive fond of the general, and he of her. They are very happy in each other. 
Well, the war finally ended after the eight long years, and Martha's only surviving child, uh, Jackie, had barely been in the war, had gone to Yorktown and developed what they call camp fever and died. He was a very young man. He already had four children. And um, the Washingtons adopted the younger two, Nellie and George Washington Park Custis, and came back here. And that was the period when George wrote about it being a well-resorted tavern. Now, this was a letter to his mother. And the reason he wrote this letter is because he was panicked that she might move in. <laughs> and, um, and he really did not want that to happen. They had a whole arrangement that she was going to live with one of his brothers. The brother died. And, uh, and he th and he's, was perfectly happy to have uh, Mrs. Dandridge move in, Martha's mother. But he didn't want his mother anywhere near the place. And so he says, my house is at your, this is, you know, again, a typical George letter. My house is at your service, and I would press you most sincerely and most devoutly to accept it. But I am sure, and candor requires me to say, it will never answer your purposes. <laughs> For in truth, it may be compared to a well-resorted tavern, as scarcely any stranger who are going from north to south or from south to north do not spend a day or two at it. So he tells her that, he, that uh, she has three choices if she moves here. One is to always be dressed for people of distinction. Two is to appear in disabile. And the third is to be a prisoner in your own chamber. And he says to her, you wouldn't like the first, being dressed. I wouldn't like the second, you being in disabile. And, uh, and neither one of us would like the third. So she didn't come. Uh, that, was, that was February of um, 1787. And of course, that summer, he went to Philadelphia to preside over the Constitutional Convention. Because even as much as he protested that he wanted to be here, and he did love it here, and, uh, and be under his own fig and vine, uh, he really was always called back to public service. And so uh, off he went and the con presided over the, the writing of the Constitution. What an incredible feat that was, as Bill Clinton recently said, we should call it, let's make a deal, you know, <laughs> because that is what it required, and some modern members of Congress need to learn that. Um, but <coughs> then he's president, and she is the nation's first first lady. And what is that? You know, and she arrives in New York with an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. I mean, you forget that. She has two little children that she's raising. And in fact, Washington had arrived on this grand um, uh, barge coming across from uh, New Jersey. And she had gone up. She had actually had a somewhat stately procession from here to um, New York where uh, she had been called upon in Philadelphia to make a little speech and all that. And so then she gets to the barge. She's going to have the barge, too. But Martha had so much sense. She, as much as she loved her silks, and she did, she liked pretty clothes, she wore homespun to show up in New York for her first appearance as First Lady. I mean, this is the equivalent of Pat Nixon's good cloth coat. You know, um, she, she knew that she should not be in finery as she made her first appearance as First Lady. And she gets off the, the barge, and everybody's cheering her, and there's huge crowds in the streets, and little Wash, George Washington, gets lost. He's eight years old, and he's lost in the crowd. And so the first thing she has to do is find her grandchild and, uh, and then move on to uh, the huge balancing act of being the nation's first first lady, where she had to run a, an establishment that did a certain kind of formal entertaining that sounds just deadly, um, the levee, uh, which would be formal and regal enough so that this upstart little country along the Atlantic coast could be taken seriously by the major forces of Europe. But it also had to be uh, informal enough and open enough to be acceptable to the people who had just thrown off the monarchy. 
and, uh, and created a republic. It was a very difficult balancing act. And she had a levee right away. I mean, she sort of put the kids in school, had a levee. And, um, and actually, one of them, because the women all wore those feathers, and one of them, somebody's feathers caught fire in the chandelier. That was, that was a more lively one than most. And um, <laughs> she wrote that uh, Nellie, was a, Nellie was a wild little creature, so she was hard to keep track of. And um, she had to worry constantly about, of course, her own appearance, just as first ladies always do. She did order, one of the letters we have, she did order a new set of teeth. So it wasn't just George doing that. And um, they were big, she needed them bigger and thicker in front, she said. Uh, but she, uh, Eliza Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton's wife, remembered uh, Martha saying, they call me first lady in the land, which is which surprised me because the first first lady to actually be publicly called that was Harriet Lane in the uh, Buchanan administration. But she used, at least Eliza quoted her saying that. So they call me first first lady in the land and think I must be extremely happy. They might more properly call me the chief state prisoner. <laughs> and uh, And of course, First ladies ever since have felt the same way. And she did write something along those lines to her niece as well, chief state prisoner. When the capital moved again, there she's moving again from New York to Philadelphia. She did it with complete equanimity, saying, I have been so long accustomed to conform to events which are go governed by the public voice, I hardly dare indulge any personal wishes which cannot yield to that. Duty, again doing her duty. And it was the story of her life. Um, she did sometimes, however, indulge in personal views. Um, she very much liked veterans. She had spent the war with the army. And um, they would come to call, and she would give them little handouts and visit with them. But she also lobbied the first Congress for veterans' benefits from the Revolutionary War. And it's something that I think is very important to keep in mind because people are so um, really uh, ignorant of the role of first ladies. They think that everybody sort of sat around tending to the tatting until it got to Eleanor Roosevelt. And it's just simply not the case. They were all involved in one way or another unless some tragedy had befallen them. You know, uh, Jane Pierce was child, last child had just been killed before she got to the White House and she withdrew. But by and large, they were all involved in some cause or another and had something they were working the Congress on. Um, and she also um, indulged in political views. Her grandson, Wash, remembered um, after someone had been to the house to call on Nellie, because now Nellie is growing up, uh, he says, his grandmother's attention was arrested by a blemish on the wall, which had been newly painted a delicate cream color. Ah, it was no Federalist, she exclaimed, looking at the spot just above the settee. None but a filthy Democrat would mark a place with, this, with his good-for-nothing head in that manner. <laughs> now, the Democrats had started to criticize her, and they had called her levees monarchial. And they had started to criticize the president as well. Uh, but she was coming in for public criticism in the press. Again, this is not anything new under the sun. And, um, and they really were ready to come back here. Uh, and uh, actually, he was ready, very ready to come back after the first term. And um, uh, the only thing by then that uh, Hamilton and Madison could agree on was that Washington needed to run for a second term. And they begged him to do it, and he kept saying, no, I've, done, I've had it, I've done my duty, I'm going home. And um, finally, the election was December of 1792. Finally, in November, um, Eliza Powell, Eliza Willing Powell, came to tea, and she was a very smart Federalist woman in Philadelphia. <laughs> And he told her he wasn't going to run again. He was absolutely not going to run again. And she wrote him a letter that many people think was the decider letter, where she appealed to his sense of his sense of duty and his sense of history and his sense of patriotism. But since it was a letter from a woman to a man, she also appealed to his sense of 
pride. And uh, she said, you are the only person who can uh, basically bring everyone together. Your very figure is calculated to induce respect, you know, calling on his hunkiness. And um, <laughs> it worked. He ran again and the country was saved. Um, but, but then after the second term, he had had it. And of course, that really did establish in, uh, until Roosevelt the two terms. Uh, nobody ran for a third uh, until Roosevelt. And they came back. The entertaining started again. Uh, but then he died at the end of 1799, so it's only here a couple of years. Uh, but the entertaining still didn't top, stop after he died. Every, even though she had sort of retired to her room upstairs, the room upstairs, still everybody came through, particularly any politician. It's so interesting because it's so much like it is today. Any politician who wanted to show the voters uh, that he was paying homage to the founder would come and see, see Martha. Uh, and, and plenty of curiosities seekers as well. But Thomas Jefferson, you know, when he was elected, made the dutiful call, came over here, and she received him, even though she had called him the most detestable of all mankind. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, she didn't mince any words about it. Um, but um, everyone said, there were lots of letters about it, uh, how grac gracious and hospitable she was. And many people stayed the night. So she was still having to run the well-resorted tavern. Uh, after he died. Also after he died, she was called upon to make one more sacrifice for the public good, which was she was asked to, and John Adams sent his nephew as an um, emissary, uh, to allow President Washington to be buried, uh, reburied at the U.S. Capitol, which was a construction site. And um, she agreed, she said, because she had learned never to oppose my private wishes to the public will. But she added, I cannot say what a sacrifice of individual feeling I make to a sense of public duty. This was finally one sacrifice she didn't have to make. Uh, as you know, it never happened. The Congress never got its act together, and he remains buried here, and she uh, joined him in the tomb in 1802. Uh, took till 1884 for the monument in Washington uh, to be completed uh, in the city that bears his name. Here, of course, what we have is a much more alive, living monument where you really get to know the man and his place. I just wish that they called it George and Martha Washington's Mount Vernon. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take your question. Thank you. Questions? There's a microphone wandering too. Yes. How old was she when she had to go to New York? I don't really know. Um, but she was old enough. I mean, she wasn't a baby. She had been married before, remember. And, um, and by the time she married again, she was still in her 20s, But because she, she had married the first time very young, as, as was done. And they had had, she and Daniel Park Custis had had four children. Two had died before she met George. And there's, there's some evidence that she was very reluctant to marry again because, of course, married women couldn't own property. You know, you became the property of your husband. And she liked owning property. And uh, we do have her letters, some letters, that she wrote to suppliers in uh, Great Britain after uh, Custis died, saying, I'm taking over now, and you know, you do business with me, and all that. And there's some hysterical 19th century biographies that basically say, you know, he came along and swept her off her feet. And that might be true. Uh, and uh, I mean, he really was very good looking. And, um, and they were the same age, now that I think of it. They were exactly the same age. Um, but she was very s small, and he was very tall. And you know, it was it was a romance. You know. 
Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious in all of the research that you did for the book, what was most surprising to you? Well, all, it's always surprising. I mean, there are all kinds of things that um, stand out just because you don't expect to have that degree of personal uh, conversation with somebody because the men's letters are so pompous. Um, but um, <laughs> my favorite actually was in the, 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 so I write mainly about Martha in a book called Founding Mothers, which goes from the period of the lead up to the war to the uh, <clears throat> inauguration of John Adams, because that was the first contested election under the new constitution. Um, then I have a sequel called Ladies of Liberty which goes from John Adams to John Quincy Adams, which is literally the next generation, right? So the founding generation, done. And in that book, I came upon a letter that just, I mean, it just doesn't get any better than this. Um, again, unpublished, uh, because the, you know, the guy historians don't publish them, um, or, or and I actually don't even read them. Um, and this one um, was from Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife. And at this point, um, he is Secretary of State, and it's 1820. And his, um, uh, and Abigail Adams has died. It was 1818 she died. And old John Adams is back in Quincy, and, and he wants Washington gossip. And Louisa Catherine Adams supplied it. And she wrote wonderful letters, all you know, newsy and interesting, but also deeply political. All that she said, she said at one point, "It is my vocation to get my husband elected president." You know, so, so they they knew what they were doing politically. But the year of the Missouri Compromise, which was 1820, Congress stayed in session much longer than it normally did uh, because to hammer out the compromise, right? And uh, so finally, they go home. And she goes to a meeting of, in June, to a meeting of the trustees of the Washington Female Orphan Asylum, which Dolly Madison had established with some other women in Washington after the British invasion in 1814 to take care of the children who had been orphaned, the girls who had been orphaned. And so she goes to a meeting of the trustees, and one of them says to her, um, we're going to need more space in the fall. And she says, why? And uh, the woman says, well, um, the session had been very long. And the Congress has left 40 cases that will be coming to us for care. 40 pregnant women left behind by the Congress. And, and the Congress was only a couple hundred people. Now, I, you know, it's possible there were recidivists, uh, but. Um, <laughs> So she was just outraged, and she says, you know, it says, she says, the fathers of our nation, the great and moral body, she's underlining everything, you know, uh, had left these cases that would, you know, that would, we would have to take care of. And she says to old John Adams, she says, so I have suggested a resolution that they take the $2 additional that they have voted for an increase in pay to themselves and use it for the for an institution for their illicit progeny. <laughs> now, honestly, it doesn't get any better than that. And um, but there are lots of letters where you just you just can't believe. I mean, the, this book that I've just written, Verena Davis uh, is uh, Jefferson Davis's wife, who is really tart-tongued and wonderful, um, is furious because. Adele Cutts, who was Dolly Madison's great niece, was this great beauty, and everybody loved her. She was this, she was just, it was remarkable. She had no position. She was a teenage girl, and, um, but still she was kind of the reigning belle. This is the 1850s, and, um, and right after the 1856 election, she married Stephen Douglas, and 
Verena Davis was furious, and she says, you know, this has happened because her family is impecunious and her father just wants to marry her off to him because he's got money from his first wife, and he stinks. And he says, she says, I hope the new water system gets here soon because otherwise everybody's going to have to open their windows a lot wider when he comes into the room. So, you know, I didn't know that about Stephen Douglas. Um, so, no, it's just it's just much more complete. It's just you just get and and you know and and sometimes it's the equivalent of a tweet. You know, uh, it's um, uh, we need to declare war against France. I forgot my bonnet. Can you send it? Uh, you know, um, uh, so and so's baby just died. You know, and you get a you know a picture. Yeah. yeah. Well, her father-in-law was a was a tyrant, um, and um, he was furious at his son for marrying her in the first place. She was poor and young, uh, and, and he thought that um, uh, his son could do better. He insisted that they all be named Park Custis. I mean, every single one of them is Park Custis, you know. And um, uh, then. She did marry anyway uh, on her own, uh, but I, it's hard to know much more than that other than that we know that it was a cantankerous relationship. We do have, as we were, Doug and I were talking about it earlier, it's at the Pennsylvania Historical Society for some reason, um, the cookbook that her first mother-in-law gave her. And it's quite interesting because it not only has a lot of recipes that are, are good, there's a crab soup one that's quite good, um, but um, although I would add corn, uh, but, um, <laughs> and Tabasco. But, um, but um, she also has, because this is kind of what a plantation mistress needed to do, all kinds of cures and uh, cleaning tips, I mean, there's a little Heloise going on there, and uh, but including things like how to treat a breast cancer. Now it wouldn't work, but you know, but it was it was something they thought about. Um, and that book, Doug and I were talking about it. So it's her first mother-in-law. So it's got to be 17th century at least. And then that raises the question: Who could read? Who cooked? So I guess what happened was that the the owner of the establishment read and told the cook because they didn't cook. No, they didn't go out to those outer kitchens and cook. Okay. Could I just ask? I, didn't her father-in-law fight her over her husband's estate? Sure, of course. And that went on for a while. I don't know how long that went on, but George Washington, unlike. The, unlike uh, James Madison, who tried, but you know it was impossible because Dolly's son was so awful, uh, and unlike Thomas Jefferson, George Washington was a good custodian of the estate. He managed her money well, and um, and protected her and her children, um, and and you know her daughter-in-law uh, married a Calvert, and she had a baby a year. You know, they, yeah. and so the two older girls, um, Martha and uh, Eliza, right? Yeah, um, really resented it. So our our little sister and brother are off in New York with the president, and we're here with all these babies. That, you know, the mama's making us take care of. Not fair, you know. But this is an interesting thing about how good a custodian George Washington was. He made Eliza because she was marrying a ne'er-do-well Englishman who had Asiatic sons. Um, but she, <laughs> she, she made, Eli he made Eliza sign a prenup. And uh, I mean, think of that, that's really foresightful. And it was very wise, because they did get divorced. It was a very shocking divorce. Um, but, um, and she, her, a distant relative of hers is a complicated story of who, how they related, but uh, wrote uh, that she really should have been a man. She wanted to be in charge of things. She didn't, you know, she was too smart to be a woman. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think that the, 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 the,
Aside from the fact that uh, the male historians just don't talk about these people, what motivated you to write them? <laughs> I mean, and for that matter, all your other books, which um, endorse the female heroes of the founding era. Well, I'm a woman, <laughs> but, um, no, but seriously, I do, I do have to spend a lot of time with the Founding Fathers. You know, I mean, just, in fact, just last night I went back, uh, because Ted Cruz was announcing today, to read about natural born citizen in the Constitution and the arguments, you know, for, that what they were really worried about was that the Pope was going to come, you know, and, and find somebody to make president. But, um, but, so, you're constantly, if you do your job well covering Congress and politics, you're constantly dealing with the Bounty Fathers. And as I was saying to Doug earlier, the members of Congress quote them, con or, or, or allude to them constantly. <laughs> and um, and they are wrong about 99% of the time. But um, And of course on the stump, they're always wrong. But um, But so I, got very curious about, I mean, it's such a, it's such a crucial period of our history um, about what the women were doing while the men were thinking great thoughts and fighting and all of that. And, um, uh, and I covered women in politics uh, in the modern age, and I grew up in a political family where I saw the tremendous influence of women who were not in office uh, in those years. So I figured the women of this uh, crucial period were at least as influential as the women of the 1950s. And um, I went back really just to read about them and discovered I couldn't uh, because very little was written. So that's when I started doing the work. If I wanted to read about them, I had to do it myself. So, I yes, yeah. Martha, uh, the question was, does Martha have uh, best friend or close girlfriends that she wrote letters to? She had female relatives. They were more, her, she was more a mentor than a best friend. But she, uh, she took in nieces and, but this was very common, you know, for nieces to come live with you and all that. And, um, and his nieces too. Uh, I think she was friendly with some of the other, the women were friendly with each other. Um, and Abigail Adams writes uh, about how much she enjoys her time with Martha Washington. And um, Dolly Madison's sister was married to George Washington's nephew. And so um, Dolly came to Martha and said, should I marry James? Because he was considerably older than she was. And Martha apparently told her yes. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, and they, there was a certain amount of recipe trading uh, so there is a, a connection among them. And then the women of Philadelphia, um, Maria Mars was a friend, um, Eliza Powell was a friend, and <laughs> after Washington died, other women in Philadelphia wrote, any time they bring up General Washington, Mrs. Powell brings out her handkerchief, you know, <laughs> to show you how close they were, right? Um, so. She, she, I don't have how she felt about them. Uh, we do have how they felt about her, which was quite positive. But, you know, John Adams was certainly on the same page with George Wa uh, Washington, but he was one of the most irascible human beings you'd ever want to meet. Um, and, and Martha probably, would, it would not surprise me if Martha thought that Abigail was a little out there, because Martha was a Southern woman and knew how to do things with more of a, 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 a style and, uh, and um, somewhat deviously, you know. Um, <laughs> and not, devious is the wrong word, but indirectly. Um, and um, uh, and uh, Abigail Adams didn't have an indirect bone in her body. And, and actually there's one Philadelphia letter saying, oh, instead of 
you know, Martha Washington, we've got this beady-eyed woman who's in here, you know, telling everybody what to do. And if they, and they had a niece living with them too. And if they think this ugly Louisa can take the place of the lovely Nellie Custis, they're crazy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you do have all of that. I mean, to the degree that you can get letters from other people, you get glimpses of them, you know. But it's, it's obviously you, what you like best is the letters they write themselves. And, you know. It seems everyone liked her. People do seem, to seem to very much do seem to have liked her. Yeah. Yes. Wait, wait, let me give it somebody who hasn't has. Yeah. I think I'm going to say. Yeah. 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 When, the question is, did she ever get any slack for not producing an heir? You have to assume the problem was George's. I mean, she had had four children. Um, so uh, you have to assume that. And actually, there's a whole school of thought that the fact that he did not have an heir, uh, was a, a male heir, uh, is what led to the republic continuing as a republic as opposed to a monarchy. That had he had a male heir, that things might have been different in our history. Who knows, you know, but that is a school of thought. Do you have one more question? Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that there were rumors um, that she may be a royalist. Um, what, what were the rumors? They were just, you know, they were very early, and, um, you know, she was a proper lady living in a very nice place and uh, they had, when Burgesses was, you know, in session, they would go to the uh, British governors to be entertained. Um, so uh, I think there was just an assumption that someone of her class might be, uh, might be pro-British and so she, she put the kibosh on that very fast. That rumor was out there about Martha Jefferson as well. And that lasted longer because she never traveled. Um. Well, thank you very much. Let's give a great night. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. What a treat to be with you. Have a great woman tell the story of one of the greatest <laughs> women in American history. It's an incredible honor here. Now, I'd be remiss if I allowed you all to go. I have to direct some traffic, of course. But before we do that, I do want to uh, mention a few people who are in the audience, particularly uh, one of the former vice regents, uh, Mrs. Uh, Davis, the former vice regent from Tennessee. Can you please stand up? <laughs> As, uh, 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 when you're a vice regent, it's like being a Marine. You could never be a former vice regent. Right. Really. You're always a lady to us. Uh, and then in the back, of course, we have our current vice regent from North Carolina here, uh, Mrs. Jean Sherrill. Please, uh, Mrs. Sherrill, stand up. <laughs> the leadership of these women who kept this place going and have allowed us to do great events like the one this evening. And I have one more thing, excuse me, if I may. Ah. I have a gift oh, thank for uh, Koki. Now, what you should know is that Koki is so generous with her time to Mount Vernon. She's helped out in so many different things, as she's mentioned. Our <laughs> teachers have been a great benefit to our teachers. The Teachers Institute is just wonderful. It really is. And it's only possible because of the generous help of our donors and people like Koki who do it without remuneration. She's not one of these people that insists on getting a large check to come here. Uh, that, of course, allows us to supply you with more liquor. Uh, <laughs> a very good thing. But, but we can do a little bit, and, and we're going to present her with this garden book. This oh, great. Is the first publication out of oh, the library. Thank you. Oh, it has nice. three uh, wonderful academic and popular essays oh, in it about you. the way that Washington and Martha designed their landscape uh, and managed their gardens uh, at the estate Thank as well you. as the archaeological recovery oh, of the upper garden is all in there plus all new pictures and images it was published in february it's brand new Thank so, you. that's so and it's beautiful i see thank you very well, much all right. so you can buy her books <laughs> 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 <laughs>
He won't allow her to leave until she signs everybody's books, right? Is that right? <laughs> and there's drinks down at the end of the hall, so I'll see you then. We can continue the conversation. No, my goodness. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. So we're going to ask you over to this table here where you can sign away.